What's up guys, it's Myers from Audio Judgment and today we are going to talk about standing waves. I've built a few floor standing speakers in the past and in each one I encountered standing waves issues. If you don't have an intricate design inside of your enclosure, a standing wave might develop and severely affect speaker performance if not dealt with. Here's what we'll do. First, we are going to find out what are these standing waves and how do they form. Then we are going to measure a floor standing speaker which has this problem. And finally, we are going to fix the issue trying different methods and see how effective they are. Standing waves form in many places, but what concerns this video, we are going to focus on standing waves inside speaker boxes. For the time being, let's forget about the speaker box and create an imaginary scenario. You have a sound source which emits a brief tone. That tone will go into all directions. The sound will slowly fade as the energy of the sound is completely dissipated by absorption in the air. Now let's add two parallel walls in the mix, which have reflective properties. The sound propagated to the sides will reach the walls and get reflected back. The reflected wave reaches the opposite wall and gets reflected once again. This continues until all the energy of the wave is depleted. Problem is that the direct sound and the consequent reflections interact with each other. Depending on the distance between the walls, some frequencies will form standing waves, which means some frequencies will get boosted and form peaks in the frequency response. As a result, standing waves can ruin the frequency response of your speaker. In addition, if the enclosure is not strong or braced sufficiently, a standing wave can make the box ring at those particular frequencies. The condition uh, of a standing wave to form is that the distance between the two walls needs to be half of the wavelength of that particular frequency. Also, additional standing waves will appear at multiples of that frequencies. Uh, here's a practical example. Let's say you have a floor standing speaker with a distance between the top and bottom panel of 800 millimeters, which is 0 0.8 meters. The standing wave will have half wavelength of 0 0.8, therefore the full wavelength is at 1.6 meters. To find the frequency, we divide the speed of sound, which is 343 meters per second, to 1.6, which is equal to 214 hertz. This means a standing wave might form at 214 hertz, and also at multiples of 214 so 428 Hz, 856 Hz, etc. What concerns the speaker box, we have three pairs of parallel walls, which means that individual standing waves can form between each of these three pairs. Now, this is not the case to get all worried that standing waves will form all over the place. Instead, this is meant to be a warning for something that indeed might be a poor design choice. For example, choosing to build a cube box. Since a cube will have the same distance between top and bottom, back to front and left to right, if a standing wave would form between two of these panels, the same standing wave will form between the additional two pairs of opposing panels meaning that the standing wave will be three times as strong. A question that might pop into mind is what about the subwoofers I saw from reputable manufacturers which have a square baffle. This means two pairs of opposing panels will be at the same distance, so top to bottom and left to right. Isn't that a poor design choice? Well, it isn't. Subwoofers work with really low frequencies. Let's say the highest the subwoofer will go is 120 Hz. 120 Hz has a wavelength of 2.86 meters, so the half wavelength is 1.43 meters. Have you ever seen a subwoofer with a baffle of 1.4 times 1.4 meters? Now that I think about it, if you put that sub on the floor, it will probably reach your chest level.
In conclusion, if you see a subwoofer with a square baffle of 1.4 by 1.4 meters, then yeah, that's a poor design choice. For subwoofers, standing waves are not much of an issue as the distance between opposing panels is not that large and the longer wavelengths of the base don't have the opportunity to form standing waves inside such boxes. However, if you are a perfectionist, there are ideal ratios when it comes to distance between panels to minimize standing wave forming. Here's a list of golden ratios. Confused of how this ratio work? Let's take the first ratio. The next dimensions I talk about are internal dimensions. So for example, you choose the width of the box to be 50 centimeters, then you are forced to pick the other depth or height to be 58.5 centimeters. The remaining dimension will be 73.5 centimeters. Of course, when you pick the first dimension, you have to pick it carefully, as when you calculate the other two, the resulting volume needs to be the one you are after. Normally, these ratios will result in boxes which are not pleasing to the eye or create other building difficulties, and they are not often used. So, hopefully, now you understand how standing waves work. Let's take a look at a practical example. I've been working on a floor standing speaker, a project designed for cheap budgets. So if you want to check out those speakers, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. And as with most floor standing speakers, the distance between the top and bottom panel is sufficiently large to allow forming of standing waves. This case is no exception. In my experience, I found there are two ways to determine if there are standing waves lurking inside your box. One is to do an impedance measurement and two would be a near field measurement of the base speaker and port if present. We will cover both of them. Let's start with the impedance measurement. Since this is a base reflex enclosure, we expect a few things. Two peaks in the lower frequencies. The dip between those two peaks marks the resonant frequency of the box and a rising impedance curve as a result of the inductance of the voice coil. That's all normal. What's out of the ordinary is this. What is this? This peak right here. It basically signals that there is a problem somewhere. In our case, the standing wave inside the box. And also, these little peaks might suggest the resonant modes of the initial standing wave. However, little ripples might appear in the impedance measurement with no obvious issue, so don't jump to conclusions just yet. Anyway, it's a bit suspicious that these ripples appear at almost perfect multiples. Now let's check out the frequency response measurement method. We do a near field measurement of the speaker and of the port. If you don't know how to do this, you can check out my Acoustics 201 course. So let's start with the speaker. Near field speaker measurement also reveals the resonant frequency of the box, because at resonance, the speaker barely moves and the port takes over all of the energy of the system. As a result, the dip right here coincides with the resonant frequency of the box. From here onward, it should be smooth response, and everything above uh, uh, 700 Hz is not accurate for this type of measurement, so ignore all of that. However, we see this ugly dip-peak combo. If I show the port response, we can see the maximum amplitude corresponds with the dip of the speaker. Nice. However, a large peak at around 175-180 Hz is developing. Also, at around 345 Hz, another one. Remember those multiples I talked about. 175 Hz times 2 is equal to 350 Hz, so a pattern is emerging. So let's do some calculations. Our floor standing speaker has a height of 960 mm if we subtract 18 mm of the top panel and 18 mm of the bottom panel, we are left with 924 mm of internal height. After a few calculations, we can see that our standing wave at 180 Hz is very close to the theoretical numbers and it does make sense that this issue is present. 
To fix this, just use dense sound dampening material. In this case, since the port is in the upper part, I can fill the whole base with the dampening material. Let's see what uh, that has done to the response. Let's start with the impedance response. As you can see, that sharp peak is gone. Another thing that you want to consider is that the resonant frequency has gone down. It was like 47 Hz, now it's somewhere around 42 Hz. If you are familiar with the effects of filling a sealed box with dampening material, it's basically the same thing here. It increases the perceived volume of the enclosure, therefore decreasing the resonant frequency of the box. So you have to take this into consideration for your final result. If we look at the frequency response, we can see that the peak is gone and the response is much flatter. However, I still see this awkward pattern at around 600 Hz, which is present in the impedance plot as well. If you want to go ahead and dampen the speaker even more, you can use rock wool and line additional walls until you see this thing go away. In addition, if your speaker has a port located at the bottom, you can go ahead and start directly with rock wool as filling the lower chamber with dampening material will obstruct the port. Out of curiosity, I tried to place some panels in the bottom chamber. The idea was to somehow transform the box from a rectangular shape to a wedge so that the bottom and top panels are not parallel. However, the effects of my idea were non-existent the response looks like I did absolutely nothing. Oh well, maybe some other time I will try a more thought out design inside the box, not just some panels thrown in there and see how that turns out. Anyway, now you know that dampening material does wonders if you have standing waves issues. Well, at least the dense stuff, because I doubt the egg grade dampening will solve anything. So go ahead and eliminate those unwanted noises inside your enclosures, have fun with your DIY projects, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.